Hello everybody, welcome back to the Young Fan Podcast and welcome to another League One Roundup. An incredible set of League One games yesterday. 26 goals spread across some incredible League One clashes. And today I'm going to pick four to break down, discuss, tactically pinpoint different aspects of the game, some key players as well, and really get a grip of what happened in League One yesterday. Like I said, some incredible, incredible games. I could have picked all of them. I'm only going to pick four today. We will discuss the other results as well. Of course, we'll have a look at the league table as always. But I also want to yeah, break down four big games. And like I said, I really could pick any games. But there were some extraordinary results, some extraordinary games yesterday. I cannot wait to get into it. If you enjoy this episode of the podcast, you want to see content like this more often, then please hit that subscribe button. We've been doing this since the start of the season. So please show your support by hitting that subscribe button. We're on the road to seven. 100 subscribers we are 15 subscribers away from 700 it would mean the world to hit 700 so please be part of the journey hit that subscribe button it's free it's easy there's a little bell next to it as well the notification bell hit that as well because that way you'll be notified every time i go live or do a recorded episode just like this one a notification will never do a miss Anyway, also, if you enjoyed the episode of the podcast, wait until you probably get into it first. But hit that like button if you want to see, like I said, more of this sort of content. And if you enjoy this episode as well. Enough waffle, enough messing about. Let's get straight into it. Remember, the comment section is always open to give your thoughts on these games as well. I'm intrigued to hear your thoughts and opinions on yesterday's games. I know there'll be some really, really interesting perspectives in the comments down below. I'm absolutely blessed to have some amazing fans from so many different clubs watching the podcast. And as always, I want to hear from you in the comments. I'm responding, replying to all of them as per usual. Let's get straight into it. So we're going to start off with Wickham against MK Dons. Is this a shock? Let's have a look at the league table first. Now I'm going to say it probably isn't. For me, MK Dons have been absolutely brilliant this season. A few rocky results here and there, but generally the moment, four, go- uh, four wins in five games, a really, really good run of form. They're in fourth place in the league as well. And most importantly, they're keeping hold of their players in this January transfer window. We talked about this January transfer window. We did it right at the start of January, did an episode, and we said how important it was for MK Dons, maybe not just to recruit players, but also to retain and keep hold of these players as well. And so far, they are doing that. Scott Twine got a goal yesterday against Wickham, got the only goal in the game. A player that, of course, has a lot of speculation around his future. So far, MK Dons are able to keep hold of him. And you can see yesterday with his goal how important, how significant that could be. For Wickham, though, I mean, two defeats on the bounce now is not looking too pretty. Still, though, they're fifth in the league, so the league position is still looking very, very good. But in terms of their recent form in the last two games, there might be a level of concern with Gareth Ainsworth and this squad. Maybe to look at bringing some players in. I believe, as of recording, they haven't brought anyone in just yet. I could be wrong, but I thought, I'm pretty sure, as of recording, no player has joined the club. And of course, we're going to have a look at the stats as well. And this is this is how the teams uh, lined up. You can see uh, both teams go with the three at the back. Both teams uh, going with the four across the middle. And then slightly different way of, of playing in, those, in that attacking phase there. You see Wickham play their usual uh, one man up front and sort of two players behind him. Quite a narrow uh, formation, if you like. And again, we'll, we'll look at the average positions in just a second. And also, we see with MK Dons, you can see this more, I guess, front line, front three formation with the two wingers, if you like, and the centre four. Forward. And you can see how Scott Twine and how influential Scott Twine has been. I want to pinpoint Scott Twine out. Um, I think this is really, really quite interesting. A goal in the game as well. But most importantly, I want to look at these touches here. 41 touch in the game. Really, really influential in what he did. Um, and a really, really good performance for Scott Twine. A 7 out of 10 average rating. Not the best average rating actually interesting here across his MK Don squad. And talking of average ratings, let's have a look at this. A higher average rating for Wickham, the losing side. They average a 6.82 average rating across the players yesterday, whereas MK Dons had a 6.81. So only 0.01 different, but really quite, really quite interesting. The losing team with the higher average rating across the board. Really, really quite fascinating that. And that brings over now to the in-game statistics. But first of all, let's have a look at this momentum graph. At the start of the game, the MK Dons at the bottom there in the blue, Wickham are in the green, to make it a little bit more confusing. You can see the start of the game was really, really quite quiet, and I can sort of see how that goes. I've watched Wickham twice this season. Like You know, I think we can all know, and, and we all do know how Wickham like to play. But you can see it's quite quiet, and then some little spikes across the game. But even though even though MK Dons win the game, I, I, I mean, they did have the bigger spikes in that. And I think, looking at the momentum graph as well, they probably did 
looking at that, deserve to win it. They're quite unlucky not to score sort of around that sort of 30 minute mark. In the second half, it was, to be fair, all Wickham, and that's probably where they would have wanted to sort of get that equalising goal. But generally, looking at that, MK Dons had the bigger spikes. So when it comes to attacking momentum, you can't really say that MK Dons didn't deserve to win the game. We look at the stats as well. They dominated the ball with 53% possession. They didn't have as many shots. They did have more on target. But the big chances for me, as expected with those attacking momentum, uh, spikes during the game. Three big chances altogether. Um... Uh, for, um, sorry, one big chance, uh, no, sorry, two big chances, two big chances for MK Dons, uh, and of course one of them missed, the other one of course hit the back of the net, uh, and for Wickham, one big chance in the game, and it was missed, so that's going to be really quite disappointing, they actually hit the woodwork as well, MK Dons in the game. So it seems quite a tight game, possession stats are quite tight, the, you know, when we look at the individual um, statistics across the game as well, that suggests it's quite tight, the average ratings across gross, uh, both players and both sets of players across the teams, again, is so, so tight. Everything really suggests that this game was really, really quite a tough encounter for both sides. But MK Dons had the bigger spikes, and in those bigger spikes, they managed to get a goal. So it finishes uh, Wickham nil, MK Dons won. A really interesting game, that one. That seems quite a tight, edgy encounter, but MK Dons managed to edge Wickham out of this one as they win 1-0. So the next game I want to talk about then, I mean, like I said, we could speak about so many, so many different games. I want to talk about this one, though. Sheffield Wednesday again, Ipswich Town. I mean, we talk about Ipswich in the moment with, of course, uh, McKenna. Now, this is, I believe, his third or fourth game now in charge. Um, a lot of postponements have made that difficult to work out. But you can see they won uh, their, their previous game. Before this one, uh, but another defeat again today against Sheffield Wednesday uh, here. And there'll be a sense of disappointment there for Ipswich. And although they are knocking on the door, you can see they're now in ninth. And uh, the season certainly isn't over. Any eight points away from six. So there really is a chance for them to continue pushing up the table. Um, and... Um, knocking on that top six door. I think the reason making a change in sacking Paul Cook and bringing uh, McKenna in was to see if we could, or see if they could see some sort of improvement by changing the manager. They have done some business in the window as well. So really, really quite interesting. I think it was quite intriguing, actually, this sort of game uh, to see sort of how, how Sheffield Wednesday uh, would cope with this one. Losing, of course, their last game last weekend against Oxford United. They also lost the game in the own 3-2, sort of a last 10-minute uh, defeat for them. And there will be a real sense of disappointment for them. They need to bounce back today. A home game against Ipswich, a team that are very, very close to them in the league. Um, and how are they going to deal with it? Eighth versus ninth going into this game. Eighth versus ninth at the end of this game. This is really, really quite a, a, quite a fascinating game. Now, first of all, we'll go over to the momentum graph. I think that's a, always a nice sort of play, a, a, always a good place to start when we look at how the game individually across the, across the board went. And you can see here, very, very up and down when it comes to that graph. You can see there, uh, you know, Sheffield Wednesday had their spikes, Ipswich had their spikes. No one had an unbelievable set of spikes in one dominant patch, really, really quite high. It was always quite edgy, quite small across the board. The only real big patch in that first half was in this segment here. Around, I'd like to say, probably the 30-minute to 40-minute mark, um, where it was all Sheffield Wednesday. But even then, they weren't really having that unbelievable amount of attacking momentum. They weren't dominating the game in the final third. They just probably had a lot of the ball and were trying to get into those attacking areas um, during that time. Interestingly, the goal came with the first spike of the game here. Probably about the 15-minute mark, I'm going to put it at the 6-minute mark, very, very early on, actually. So, yeah, the sixth minute, uh, Callum Lang, uh, sorry, Marvin Johnson got his goal. Um, uh, Marvin Johnson got the goal in the in, in the first or six minutes of the game. So, so impressed with that. Um, and, and you can see there as well that it was a bit up and down. Ipswich had a, had a really good sort of set of, set of I guess, moments of in that offensive area sort of in the last sort of 10 minutes of the game, last 15 minutes of the game. They weren't able to make it count. The game does finish 1-0. And we look um, at you know look at the individual performances as well. You can see Sheffield Wednesday deserved to probably win the game on average uh, average ratings. You can see they're nearly a seven average rating out of ten across the board, which is really really quite impressive for Ipswich. Not the best individual performance. Bomb didn't have a great game either. You can see here as well. Uh, but I want to have a look like we always do at these individual stats, especially these big chances created. No big chances at Ipswich across the game, and there'll be a level of concern there. Not uh, hitting a, a big chance across the ninety minutes it really really is quite to worry and when we talk about Bomb not having the best of games well from looking at that it doesn't seem like he had the best service in that game either not one big chance created by Ipswich and that will be a real level of concern interestingly for Sheffield Wednesday they only had uh, one bit they only had one big chance and they missed it of course their other goal that their goal 
uh, must have not come from a big chance. So really, really quite fascinating this one. Doesn't seem like the most attacking game of football. You can see their 65% possession to Ipswich. They dominated the ball. So really, really quite interesting when you look at this game. Um, they have more pass in the game, Ipswich. But you can see here, generally, Sheffield Wednesday took the chance in the first sort of 10 minutes of the game. But Ipswich had a lot of the ball, but didn't create too much with it. And there will be some concern in that camp because Kieran McKenna will have to look at this now and go, right, we had a lot of the ball. We had a really, really good ball retention in the game, but we created nothing. How are we going to pick up and go in the next one? We need to make, we make sure we're doing more with the ball, which I think is something that, of course, he'll look at. Interestingly, similar formation to Wickham as well. So that's really, really something to, to point out but there we go that's how that game finished. finishes Sheffield Wednesday uh, 1 Ipswich Town nil. Kieran McKenna needs a reaction in the next game for Sheffield Wednesday their reaction came yesterday after of course losing last weekend to Oxford they get back to winning ways at home at Hillsborough against Ipswich Town there'll be a real sense of happiness in the Darren Moore and Sheffield Wednesday camp Right, next then we're going to go to one of the nine goals uh, in this game. Um, and uh, we're going to have to talk about it, aren't we? I mean, we did a match reaction for it yesterday. Uh, but I didn't, I, I mentioned quite a lot. And if you want to sort of go into the in-depth, full-time match reaction for this one. Gillingham 2, Oxford United 7 in League 1. We did a match reaction for it yesterday. You can, we went sort of tactically, break, broke the game down a little bit more there. So I'm not going to go into as much detail in this one. But I still feel we need to talk about it. Because there is so much to break down at moments in this game. And I really want to sort of get a, a real hold of what happened yesterday at Gillingham because Oxford simply ran riot. Uh, so we look at these sort of performances across the pitch. You can see here Oxford United were absolutely brilliant. An absolutely phenomenal performance from Oxford United. Cameron Brannigan's going to be the player that stands out because he scored the four penalties. He's a bit of a record breaker yesterday. Um and, and, and so he deserves it. Like you said, he did score four penalties, which isn't easy at all. He scored four consecutive penalties in one game with the same goalkeeper against you. It's not easy at all. That's a real, real talent there for him. He had the momentum. He had the rhythm. And fair play to him. He, he bagged the four goals. But I generally thought he looked very, very good in that midfield. I know it's easy to say now he has scored four goals. But he generally did look really, really well. Him and Marcus McGuane looked really, really solid yesterday. Now, like I said in the match reaction, we weren't playing against Gilling a good Gillingham side at all. You can see here, looking at those average ratings. Their goalkeeper had an absolute nightmare. The defence completely had, a, had an absolute nightmare. And you can see there, it was a real, real day to forget for Gillingham. Without a manager, awful individual performances. You look at the average ratings, it looks like it, it was an absolute men versus boys game of football. And at moments, it really, really was. Now, there were points in the game where Gillingham were knocking on the door, especially in that second half. I think a level of complacency may have kicked in slightly, a level of, you know, taking your foot off the gas, if you like. And Gillingham were able to sort of get into the, you know, I guess, get into the game a little bit more. The issue being, they were 5 nil down. Or, or, I mean, 5-1 down. They, they, they got the goal in their first spike, the sort of second set of big spikes. They couldn't get a goal. 5-1 down, having your biggest spike of the game a little bit. I think it might be a case of a little bit too little, too late. Um, but it, there, there, was, there, was, there was an aspect of the game where Gillingham were in, 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 in a dominant force, if you like, and they were trying to attack Oxford United. Like I said, the problem being you're 5-1 down. The chance of you making the most of that spike when we're talking about scoring four goals, a little bit limited, especially against a side like Gillingham, who this season haven't got the best track record of actually scoring goals. They did score two in this game, but like I said, and four penalties across the park. I'd say three at least were stone more penalties. A few controversial ones here and there. Was the, the Dolberg incident actually outside the box, the goalkeeper one? If it was, then it's a free kick because it's definitely a foul. If it's in the penalty area, there's no denying that was a penalty. The handball looked blatant. The first one definitely was a sliding tackle wiping out our player. That was certainly given. And then the last one where it looked a little bit all hands over him and he went down. When we went down a little bit easier than normal because we know this, penalty, this, this, this uh, referee's not scared to to, to, uh, to um, point to the penalty spot. So there maybe was a level of, of that there. But ultimately, we had to score the four penalties that were given. Cameron Brannigan did that, and we won this game at 7-2. Unbelievable scenes. Now, I want to talk about as well this possession, the possession stats as well. Although Gillingham had their moments in the game, we had 60% possession to their 40. 15 shots in the game. It's not an unbelievable amount of shots. 15 shots to their 14. Interestingly, Gillingham had more shots on target. It's the big chances for me that were absolutely incredible. Seven big chances in the game. We only missed one of them. We had eight big chances. Sorry, seven big chances. We scored six. And one of them must have been the penalties. I don't really know how that all works with penalties. But... 
Seven big chances of the game. They had two, and they scored their two big chances of the game. So they were clinical, but they needed to create much, much more when, you, when you're when conceding seven big chances, and they win the game 7-2. Something must have gone wrong there. Um, but ultimately, it really, really quite a, a, you know, a great watch, really, from an Oxford perspective. For Gillingham, it's worrying. It's concerning. They haven't got a manager yet. They will be looking at this now, thinking we need to bring someone into the club as quickly as possible. So uh, for Gillingham, they need to do something really, really quickly. And... Uh, yeah, for Oxford United, a fantastic win, and uh, we're still in, we're still sixth place in the playoff places, and a massive game on Tuesday night against Wigan as well. Can we take some of this fantastic result and momentum into the next game? We really, really will have to. If it is Gillingham two, Oxford United seven. So I think there's only one place to finish off this league one round, I and mean, it has to be at Bolton. What an incredible afternoon for Bolton, and what a day they had yesterday, beating Sunderland 6-0. That's right, they beat Sunderland six goals to nil. And for Sunderland, I mean, what on earth happened? We're going to break that game down in just a second. We're going to get over to uh, the Sofa Score uh, homepage for Bolton Wanderers versus Sunderland. You can see here the momentum graph, really, really quite interesting. I mean, they had Bolton had more spikes in the game. They looked much better going forward in Sunderland. They had more uh, of that attack momentum across the game. And you can see that pretty much every time they had a spike in the game, they scored a goal. And when you do that, you're going to score by lots of goals. Now, it's very, very rare that that happens, to score a goal every, every single spike you have. Of course, there'll be this, you know, it's really, really quite rare. You've got to have a real clinical edge to do that. You've got to have a clinical striker to do that. And it looks like Bolton have signed that man in Dion Charles. What a striker uh, Dion Charles is, is, is proving to be. We know, he, we know he had talent. Last season, he's brilliant for Atkinson Stanley. He started the season really, really poorly. Um, he he just, didn't get off, just didn't get off the way that we know he can do. He's moved to Bolton in January. And since he's joined, the, he's just been absolutely brilliant and scored so, so many important goals. Two yesterday as well beating Sunderland who are third in the league 6-0 for Sunderland what on earth happened they did have moments in the game but certainly not as much as Bolton and when they did have spikes in the game unlike Bolton they didn't take their chances they couldn't be clinical and to be fair to them 2-0 down at half time the game is still definitely on at 2-0 but the second half for Bolton they absolutely run riot the first sort of two big spikes in the second half for Bolton in between sort of the 45th minute the start of the second half to about the 60th minute Two goals in that game, 4-0 down, incredible stuff. And then to finish the game off with an own goal, and then another goal as well to just absolutely bury Sunderland 6-0. What an afternoon for them. When we look at the uh, the, look at the, the, the stats as well, 58% possession. Sunderland had more possession in the game. They lost 6-0. But it's these chances here. It's the big chances as well. For me, that, that that just blows me, blows it away. Three to one in the game. Now, how can you win six 0 but only have three big chances? Well, it proves that there were there were goals in the in in the game that that definitely. I mean, one of them was an own goal for a start. So yeah, you know, that that again proves how incredible this sort of game was. It wasn't a game where there was loads and loads of huge chances, but they were so clinical what they did. And you can see there six goals in the game and, and only three big chances. And where did the other three come from? Well, they must have come from different aspects of the game. And of course, one of which was an own goal. So the other two must have come from really, really quite different aspects. And not real big chances, not goals that you'd expect uh, to score. Because of course, big chances are created through XG, which means that really those big chances and, and the goals they scored and two of the other goals that scored really should have really shouldn't have been scored ultimately. And, and that again proves the clinical edge of Bolton. It proves to have a side at the moment. They're doing so, so well. They made business. Ian Everett did business in January. They brought players in. We spoke about how they how they highlighted areas very, very clearly of where they needed to bring players in. They've done that so, so well. And we're now seeing a huge reward for Bolton, who are, again, we're bottom half of the League One table going into second half of the season. They've started this this start of the season so, so well. Now, three wins on the bounce, moving up to 14th. And again, this season for them really isn't over. They can continue to climb up the League One table. I think this could be a really, really good season for Bolton. They've absolutely executed this January transfer window to an absolute they've done so so well and we're now seeing them get a real sense of momentum a real sense of confidence from these sort of games beating third place in the league 6-0 what an absolutely unbelievable afternoon for Sunderland hopefully they for them really they won't make any more knee-jerk decisions we know what Sunderland are like when things don't go their way they can sometimes be they sometimes rush into some silly decisions I don't think it will happen Lee Johnson has been like I said a really good manager for them 
And again, they're third in the league. They can't really complain with League One positions in when it comes to the league table. But ultimately, yes, there was a real afternoon to forget, conceding six goals. And they're going to have to sit down and have a real serious look at themselves. Looking at that, the average ratings across the pitch looked like the goalkeeper had an absolute nightmare. We know that, we know that the, the poor man Danny at the back, number five, he had an absolute shocker in the game as well. We highlighted the game, I think, last week. He had a brilliant game for Sunderland when they did win the game. I mean, a day to forget yesterday, 5.9 out of 10 and an own goal in there as well. Not a good afternoon as well. Lyndon Gooch, someone we always always sort of see as, as a player that can be so influential for this Sunderland side, not having a day to remember either, getting a 5.9. But like I said, this man here, Dion Childs, what an incredible, incredible game for him yesterday. Dion Charles in this game, 9.3 out of 10, two goals and an assist, 27 chance, uh, chance, uh, 27 touches in the game, sorry, 75% pass accuracy, all of it, uh, pretty much all of his ground duels won in the game as well, um, 8 1 out of 12, so only really, only missing four ground duels in the game, so, so impressive, um, and uh, like I said, those two goals and that one assist will really stand out, such significant goals and assists as well. What an incredible afternoon for Bolton as they smash, and I mean smash, Sunderland 6. Now, I did promise we'd look at the other results as well. Plymouth uh, beat Doncaster 3-1, so a good result for Plymouth. You can see there in the game, look at that momentum graph. It was all Plymouth. Serious level of concern now, continuing for Don Doncaster, who, like I said, looking at the league table. Let's go up here. Still rock bottom of the league. For Plymouth, they drew their last game, but a nice win on the road against Doncaster yesterday. They're going to be really, really happy with that. Like I said, Doncaster needs to start getting some results quickly because they, again, are still rock bottom of the League One table. For Lincoln City, a disappointing home defeat against Burton Albion. Lincoln, of course, are a team that I said I think will have a really, really positive second half of the season. I think they still will. They've brought some really, really good players in, but still a home defeat for Burton. There's going to be a real, real sense of worry for them there because, again, like I said, that's a game they really, really could have they could have won. We look at those momentum goals. Well, it did look all Burton. It didn't look like Lincoln. They did have spikes in the game, but generally there's more blue than there is green. So I guess Burton did probably deserve to win that for attacking. We look at the stats as well to make sure. Interestingly, Lincoln had most of the ball. We know Mark Capitan likes to have the ball, but still, they couldn't really make it count. Burton had 19 shots in the game, um, and a one big chance is each as well for that one. Uh, we've spoken about this one. Crew against Rotherham. Again, Crew not having a season at all to remember for Rotherham. A nice 2-0 win. Fairly comfortable by the looks of things. A red card there for Crew as well. I'm not making it too much easier for them. And uh, yeah, that's all the games. Oh, and then finally, again, a good result probably for Cheltenham. Uh, at home to, of course, Wigan, who are having a fantastic season. A 0-0 draw. We're going to believe are still... Uh, I mean, Rotherham now climbed to the top of the league table with their win against Crew. For Gillingham, that draw... For, sorry, Wigan, that draw drops them down uh, to second in the league. Of course, they've still got two games in hand on a lot of teams around them. Uh, in, some times, in, in some cases, four, uh, four games in hand on some teams as well. Ladies and gentlemen, that was an incredible roundup. That was an incredible weekend of League One action. Of course, we've got lots of deadline day and transfer content coming to the channel in the next few days as well. So make sure you stay tuned for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been Jack. This has been the Unfan Podcast. Let me know what you've got to say about these games as well in the comments down below. I've been Jack. This has been the Unfan Podcast. Take care, stay safe. I'll see you all very, very soon. <laughs>